Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Duncan Brown and I'm a trustee with the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. I hope this webinar finds all of you that are tuned in safe and well. Before I introduce uh, Dr. Sean Roberts, tonight's speaker, a quick announcement regarding the logistics for tonight's webinar. We are using something called the Zoom webinar platform tonight, so everyone is automatically muted and will stay muted. Additionally, the only people you should see on your screen will either be myself or Dr. Roberts. Tonight's webinar will include remarks by Dr. Roberts followed, a, followed by a Q&A session. Audience questions will be handled through the Q&A function in Zoom. The Q&A button should be located on the bottom of your screen. Just click on the button, type in your question and hit return. Um, we will not be using the chat function. I will not be monitoring that. If you raise your hand, I'm not gonna call on you. You gotta use the Q&A function. Okay, so thank you for that. Please do note that this webinar is also being recorded and it will be available on the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs YouTube site within about two weeks. And now to tonight's speaker. Uh, joining the Elliott School, that's the George Washington University Elliott School in 2008 as the director of the International Development Studies Program, Dr. Sean Roberts is a cultural anthropologist with extensive ex applied experience in international development work. Having conducted ethnographic field work among the Uyghur people of Central Asia and China during the 1990s, he has published extensively on this community in scholarly journals and collected volumes. In addition, he produced a documentary film on the community entitled Waiting for Uyghur Stem in 1996. From 1998 to 2000, and then again from 2002 to 2006, Dr. Roberts worked for the United States Agency for International Development, better known as USAID, in Central Asia on democracy and government, government, governance programs. Sorry about that. Dr. Roberts' current research is focused on China's development of what they call the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, as well as on democracy development in the former Soviet Central Asia. He continues his applied work on the design and evaluation of democracy and governance projects projects in the former Soviet Union, most, re most recently in Ukraine, where he worked on a USAID project to support decentralization and anti-corruption. He received his PhD in cultur cultural anthropology, I can't talk tonight. He received his PhD in cultural anthropology from the University of Southern California. Tonight, I've asked Dr. Roberts to discuss the current situation in Western China with 1 million Muslims, the majority of them Uyghurs being held in secretive internment camps, the roots of what is occurring there, who's being targeted, how the effort is being orchestrated, and what, if anything, might, should, or could be done about it. So with that, please join me in giving a warm, albeit virtual, welcome to Dr. Sean Roberts. And sir, thank you again for joining us tonight, and over to you. Thank you. Um, so I, uh, oh, Duncan, I need you to enable the screen sharing. If you make me a co-host, that should work. Yep. All right, got it. Um, and I need to get my um, my bio updated on the university website because uh, <laughs> the other thing I I, I want to point out is I have a book that was recently published, um, "The War on the Uyghurs: uh, China's Internal Campaign Against a Muslim Minority." from Princeton University Press. Um, and uh, what I'll be talking about tonight is covered in a lot more detail there. Uh, so if, if you find um, uh, what I'm talking about to be of interest and of importance, uh, I encourage you to pick up the book. Um, so I'm gonna start very, um, very broadly by just explaining who the Uyghurs are. Uh, they're a mostly Muslim ethnic group in the People's Republic of China. Um, their religious practice uh, has historically been influenced by Sufism, but in fact, there's a lot of diversity in the way that uh, Uyghurs look at religion. Uh, they speak a Turkic language, which is uh, very closely related to the Uzbek language of Uzbekistan. In fact, the um, Languages are essentially mutually um, comprehensible. And they're more closely related culturally and historically to the peoples of Central Asia than they are to the majority Han population in the People's Republic of China. 
They are a significant uh, population, about uh, 11 million in China. But of course, that's a very small percentage of the population of the PRC. It's only less than 1%. Um, I think it's important to, to talk at the outset about where this region is, because I think that's a lot of, um, that, that has a lot to do with what's happening there. First of all, it's very much on the periphery of China. Um, it, for a long time, it was, it was more of a frontier than anything else. Um, and it's also uh, connected to multiple states to the West and Southwest. And um, during different times in the history of modern China that has had different ramifications for the way that the Chinese state has um, governed the region. Um, to talk a little bit about how this region became a part of modern China, uh, I'll give you a very brief thumbnail of the history before communist rule. So. Uh, Essentially, this region has been uh, at different times parts of different empires. It's very much at the crossroads of civilizations. Um, it's been parts of empires centered in Persia, in China, uh, in Mongolia, in uh, the Uyghur region itself. Um, and really, when we talk about it as part of modern China, uh, that only begins in the 1750s. Um, although Chinese official proclamations always talk about this being a part of China since time immemorial. Um, at that time, the last Chinese empire, which was actually um, led by Manchus, the Qing empire con conquered the region in the 1750s but it treated it more as a dependency um, and they rule, it ruled through local elites uh, for about a century. And then uh, in the 1860s, local rebellions pushed the Qing empire out. Uh, and there was some discussion within um, the imperial court as to whether they should go back and take the region because it was actually, um, an expensive region for the empire to maintain. But uh, the Qing empire did uh, launch a new conquest and conquered the region um, in the 1870s again. Um, and by the 1880s had control over the entirety of the region and named it um, a province of the empire called Xinjiang or New Frontier. And um, at this time, the Qing also instituted kind of a colonial regime trying to assimilate the local population into Confucian culture, into Chinese language, but uh, that was mostly a failure. Um, it, it was not able to do that. And by the time that the Qing Empire fell in 1911 and a nascent Chinese nation state uh, took over. It inherited this region, but it ruled it much more loosely. Um, it had Han governors who were um, in, in control of the region, um, but they had very loose relationships with the central power of Republican China. In fact, one of them was a member of the Soviet Communist Party and probably took more direction from Moscow than from Nanjing. Um, and uh, during that time, there, there's also kind of a, a national awakening among Uyghurs and um, Uyghurs start to perceive of, of their situation in terms of uh, co colonialism and occupation by Chinese powers. And there's two independent regional states that develop at this time. One in the south of the region um, from 1933 to 34, very short lived. And the other one in the north uh, between 1944 and 49, and that was um, longer lived. Um, both of them had a uh, anti-colonial ideology. Uh, the first one was very much an indigenous movement that was influenced by uh, anti-colonial ideas in the Muslim world the second Eastern Turkestan Republic. They were both named the Eastern Turkestan Republic. 
The second one was supported by the Soviet Union and had very much um, a Soviet anti-imperialism, anti-colonial ideology. And you can see the difference between um, the ways that the, the leaderships of both um, republics uh, uh, kind of expressed um, through their, their clothing. Um, uh, when the People's Republic of China came to um, power or the Communist Party in China in 1949, um, it, was, it was still possible that the Soviet-backed Eastern Turkestan Republic um, could end up being kind of a client state of the Soviet Union, independent like the Mongol, Mongolian People's Republic. But instead, it was essentially uh, folded into the People's Republic of China. And initially, um, the Chinese Communist Party um, worked very closely with the local elite. It recruited Uyghurs into the party and it, it involved them in government. Um, and it designated their homeland as the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, um, which kind of harks to the, the Soviet idea of ethnic um, federalism. But in fact, it was very different because uh, I think the Chinese Communist Party never bought into the Soviet idea of multinational uh, statehood and um, for one thing, it didn't have in its constitution the ability for these autonomous regions, uh, both you know, Xinjiang and Tibet and Mongolia, that they could secede, which was uh, at least theoretically in the Soviet constitution. Um, and by the, the late 50s, uh, I would argue the Chinese Communist Party really moves away from uh, the idea of ethnic autonomy uh, in 1957, the anti-rightist campaign purges a lot of the Uyghurs in government and also many Uyghur intellectuals. Uh, by 1959, the state is starting this official party line that this region has always been part of China and uh, the Uyghurs are actually not indigenous to the region, but relative newcomers. Um, and there's uh, an attempt throughout the 60s and 70s during the Cultural Revolution to settle the region with more Han, facilitating a demographic shift where uh, Han only made up 4% of the population in 1953, but by 1982, it was 38% of the population. Um, the Cultural Revolution also, uh, as everywhere in China, uh, sought to destroy traditional culture and religion. But I would argue to a certain extent among um, rural Uyghurs in particular, uh, that was somewhat muted in this region, partially because the state really saw this region still as a buffer zone, a frontier to keep out external influences, particularly in the context of the Sino-Soviet split um, to keep the Soviet Union out. Um, and after the Cultural Revolution, there's um, you know, a general liberalization in China. And that, that also holds true for the Uyghur region. There's, um, there's a kind of a cultural renaissance in the region. Uh, Uyghurs are allowed to reopen mosques, build new mosques. They're able to publish, um, you know, create their own music. Um, and uh, there's even discussions within the uh, leadership of the Communist Party in China about giving more uh, political autonomy to the region. But I, I think that um, the Tiananmen Square massacre really, really kind of uh, stopped that, that momentum towards liberalization, particularly in the political sphere. Um, and then in addition, the fall of the Soviet Union would influence this area a lot because uh, the Chinese Communist Party looked at the Soviet Union and immediately thought we don't want to face the same fate. We don't want to dissolve into uh, different nation states. And so the, the Chinese government became much more focused on the issue of what it called separatism. Uh, and that was true both in Tibet and in the Uyghur region.
So most of the 1990s um, were about battling separatism in the region. Um, there were um, ongoing anti-separatist campaigns that led to thousands of Uyghur arrests and major crackdowns on religious and cultural expressions. Um, but it, this was also combined with uh, attempts to incentivize uh, assimilation, particularly among the Uyghur elite. Um, and it was also combined with uh, thinking about how to integrate this region better, thinking about how to develop it economically. Um, and, and this particularly had to do with the south of the region, which the state had very little penetration of. And um, in the, by the end of the 1990s, they had built railways going down into the south, which um, really was a turning point that opened up this region more for the Chinese state. But I would argue um, that the war on terror uh, made, a, made a significant impact on the situation. Almost immediately after 9-11, the People's Republic of China tries to link Uyghur dissent to international terrorism. And it releases several documents um, saying that it, it has faced for over a decade um, a terrorist threat from Uyghurs linked to Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. And in fact, um, they, they, in, these, uh, in these policy papers, they outline um, 200 acts of violence during the 1990s that they blame on multiple groups that they say are all under one umbrella connected to Al-Qaeda. And many of these groups um, in diaspora are, are located in Europe, in the US, in Turkey, uh, a lot of other states had famili familiarity with them. They're mostly human rights groups. And um, for a long time, the international community, well, not that long, for a year, the international community kind of ignored um, this attempt by the Chinese government to link Uyghurs with the war on terror. But then uh, in the summer of 2002, the US takes kind of a sudden policy change, and it recognizes a small, previously unknown group, Uyghur group in Afghanistan as a terrorist organization linked with Al-Qaeda. Um, and uh, this happens in the summer of 2002, and there's lots of speculation that it was in part uh, kind of a concession to China to lay the groundwork so that uh, China would not oppose the US invasion of Iraq. Um, this group was, uh, is, is called the Eastern Turkestan Islamic Movement, although it never called itself that. Um, it was placed on the US terrorism exclusion list in uh, summer of 2002. The US helped get it on the UN Security Council consolidated list of terrorist organizations on September 11th, 2002. Um, the US revoked um, its designation of this group as a terrorist group uh, just last year in November, 2020, saying it hadn't been active for over a decade, but it remains on the UN Security Council list. And um, I think that, you know, the thinking probably of the US government was this is a, small, inconsequential group, um, this would be uh, a positive thing for US-Chinese counterterrorism cooperation. But in fact, this had um, significant consequences because the PRC began framing its repression of Uyghurs for the rest of the 2000s um, as a counterterrorism effort. Um, I've done a lot of research and a lot of my book is about um, trying to track down the reality of a Uyghur terrorist threat. And what I found is that there was a group of Uyghurs in Afghanistan in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, and this group was essentially almost not an organization. It was more the vision of one person who wanted to um, uh, establish a war for liberation in China uh, from a base in Afghanistan. Uh, but he had very little support. 
Um, there were very few Uyghurs uh, who came into his orbit while he was there. Um, he had tense relations with Al Qaeda because he wasn't interested in global jihadism. And the, there's evidence that the Taliban at Beijing's behest essentially quarantined um, the leadership of this group and ensured they couldn't really do anything. And there's no evidence that it ever carried out any violence anywhere in the world. And um, it disappears essentially after the death of its leader in, in 2003. There is a new group that um, uh, emerges in 2008 in Waziristan and makes videos uh, famously threatening the Beijing Olympics. Um, but my research shows that this is a really small group um, that's probably uh, not even uh, a battalion, but more integrated into foreign fighting forces in Waziristan, but it begins making videos uh, threatening China. And that um, only fuels further the kind of counterterrorism narrative that the Chinese state uses. Um, but this group has no capacity to carry out violence in China. When it makes videos about violence that occurs in China, it doesn't uh, take credit for it, but it congratulates those people who carried out violence. Um, and the group um, morphs into another group in Syria um, after uh, ethnic riots in China in 2009, there's a huge refugee influx of Uyghurs into Turkey. And it seems very likely with the help of the Turkish government, um, several thousand of these refugees um, end up in Syria with their families uh, and fighting under this banner of the Turkestan Islamic Party. But again, there's no evidence that these groups had any presence ever inside China or ever carried out violence in China, but their, their presence allowed the Chinese state to kind of launch this um, search for terrorists within the Uyghur population. And so the 2000s was characterized by um, these kind of escalating campaigns to weed out terrorists, <coughs> especially among rural Uyghurs in the Uyghur majority South. And um, this was complemented again with incentivized assimilation measures for um, elite Uyghurs, uh, promoting the Chinese language, work and study in inner China. Um, and I think the real story in the 2000s is about uh, the Chinese state really looking at this region as an important um, economic component of China and therefore investing a lot of money in mass development, building infrastructure, establishing industrial centers. And this development leads to increased Han migration and Uyghur displacement. And uh, that brings us to 2009, which is a, a crucial point uh, in, the in the story because in 2009, there's a protest in Urumqi, the capital city of this region that leads to um, uh, a law enforcement crackdown, suppresses the protest, um, and it turns into street violence between Uyghurs and Han that lasts for three days. And um, that really um, begins a process where the Chinese state starts framing Uyghurs as an existential threat to Chinese society. And, um, there's a massive crackdown um, and that leads to, um, there's a crackdown in particular in the South, again, among rural Uyghurs focus on, focused on religiosity and expressions of nationalism. And that leads to really tense relations between law enforcement and Uyghurs uh, that kind of creates a uh, cycle of violence, repression, resistance, repression. Um, and by 2013-14, that leads to a handful of violent acts targeting Han civilians that actually look like terrorism, um, but there's no evidence that they're connected to any kind of international jihadist group. And um, it's important to note that during this period, we have the rise of Xi Jinping, who is a much more authoritarian leader uh, than China's seen in a long time. 
and his announcement of the Belt and Road Initiative for which this region is very important. And that simultaneously uh, creates an environment where there's less tolerance for any kind of resistance and more urgency for development and settlement. Um, in 2014, after these, these uh, violent incidents, there's a, a campaign called the People's War on Terror um, that starts extensive suppression of religion and increased securitization. And this really leads to the present situation, um, which uh, really starts in 2017, but a lot of the infrastructure for repression starts in 2014. So I see what's been happening since 2017 as uh, I call it a cultural genocide. It's essentially an attempt to sideline the indigenous peoples of this region, which have been framed as a security risk um, so that the state can develop this region. Um, the, the goals are to um, make sure they can't resist development, pacify them, displace them, and essentially marginalize them. Uh, and there's attempts to destroy their collective identity in, in solidarity, reduce their demographic footprint uh, to allow for unfettered transformation and settler colonization of this region. Um, and while this, the motivation has more to do with state plans for the region, the result is the destruction of indigenous nations and cultures. And the justification is combating uh, what I consider an imaginary terrorist threat. So um, I know you've probably all heard about um, some of the things that have been happening through the newspapers um, or reading them on the internet. Uh, but I, I, I think that it can be confusing because you hear a lot of uh, discussion about atrocities without seeing how these, um, these policies fit together. And I, I, I see them as a complex of policies um, with the intent of destroying the Uyghur nation and uh, related uh, nations. Um, so, you know, the most headline grabbing aspect of what's happening is mass internment, these re-education camps where people are put in uh, arbitrarily for um, an arbitrary amount of time without due process. Uh, they're subjected to prison-like um, conditions and they're forced to study Chinese and um, state ideology. And, and there's lots of stories about torture, sexual violence, um, and all kinds of atrocities in them. Um, and that, that is combined with a massive uptick in imprisonments um, the imprisonments uh, in 2017 and 18 are 700 percent those um, which had existed um, in 2016. Um, and it's also bolstered by uh, this ubiquitous network of surveillance um, and a massive database that keeps track of every uh, Uyghur and, and basically is used to measure their loyalty to the state. Um, it's kind of like an electronic file on them, uh, which can be taken up by any security agency, any checkpoint to see if the person is a risk. Uh, I think really the, the point of these aspects of what's happening is to create this atmosphere of fear and compliance to ensure that the state can do other things without any kind of resistance from the population. So the other things the state is engaging in is it's transforming the landscape, it's destroying mosques, repurposing them, it's um, destroying uh, holy pilgrimage sites um, connected to the Sufi traditions in the region. It's doing urban renewal that's erasing uh, kind of the Uyghur characteristics of the architecture. And it's taking historical monuments and transforming them into uh, modern day tourist uh, destinations. Uh, and I think this is largely what the state wants to do with this region, in addition to uh, ensuring that it becomes a hub of industrial production. 
Um, there's also a process of cultural replacement happening uh, outside penal institutions. Um, and this includes uh, coerced campaigns um, to promote inter-ethnic marriage, in particular Han men marrying Uyghur women. And um, I, I call this coerced because essentially if you refuse to uh, you refu refuse a hand in marriage from somebody of a different ethnic group, uh, that is actually in um, the regulations as an act of extremism. So you, you would end up likely being sent to a re-education center or a prison. Um, and meanwhile, while you have a lot of people displaced from their families, there's also a proliferation of residential schools for children where the children can essentially be brought up in a Chinese cultural and linguistic milieu and separated from their parents. Um, and probably the most important aspect is um, we've, we've been learning more and more in the last two years about uh, residential labor programs that are intended to take rural Uyghurs um, from their villages and put them in residential factories, uh, some in other parts of the Uyghur region, and a lot of them just scattered throughout China. And this seems to be uh, a big part of um, what the state is trying to do in terms of reducing the Uyghur population density. And, and there's uh, a recent article that came out that cites a lot of Chinese think tanks that are talking about this as the ultimate way to solve a, a terrorism problem is optimizing the, the ethnic population in the region so that um, it's not the dominant ethnic group anymore that um, the Han cultural milieu is dominant. Um, and this is also aided by uh, a campaign that uh, has brought down birth rates uh, precipitately in the region through uh, for sterilizations, abortions, and um, IUD insertions. So I think the impact of this complex of policies is essentially um, to dismantle the collective identity of the indigenous peoples, pacify them, and displace slash replace them. It's not, it's not uh, an attempt to kill every Uyghur, um, but it's to reduce also their, their demographic footprint and to break up any kind of sense of collective identity. Uh, and transforming the homeland serves to erase their historical connection to it, destroying core elements of their social capital and cultural expressions and replacing those with uh, those of the dominant Han uh, is essentially a, a way to kind of erase their cultural legacy, and then reducing their demographic footprint through large scale labor transfers to residential factories and forced sterilization and birth control uh, is a way to kind of put them on the margins of um, what's happening. So in many ways, I see this as an acts of settler colonialism that we saw in the 19th century in the Americas, in the United States, in Australia, um, but it's jarring to see them as something that's um, being done in the 21st century. Um, just briefly, I want to, because I, I think this will, will probably be useful for the Q&A, is just discuss very briefly the U.S. response so far, uh, what Chinese um, response there has been to international criticism, and perhaps um, what's the way forward. So um, the U.S. has declared uh, the PRC's actions against Uyghurs as an act of genocide, which um, at least uh, legally would would um, be would ensure that the United States has to do something to stop it, per the UN Convention on Genocide. Um, it has implemented um, Magnitsky Act sa sanctions against Chinese officials and private sector. Uh, actors involved in what is happening to the Uyghurs. Um, but I, I believe that it has some really limited impact. And uh, there's attempts, particularly now, 
under the Biden administration to rally allies to speak up about this issue, um, declare the PRC's actions as genocide, implement sanctions, and so on. And there's legislation in Congress that would halt imports of all products that have Uyghur forced labor in their supply chains through these residential labor programs. Um, and that would, that would apply to a lot of, um, a lot of products coming out of China. Um, China has uh, uh, responded to international criticisms um, by first saying that these accusations are fake news, um, something I think they, they learned from uh, US discourse recently. Uh, but they also suggest that this fake news is um, a creation of the US in an attempt to stem China's rise. So an attempt to um, kind of discredit China. Um, and it discusses its measures in the region as a combination of countering violent extremism and poverty alle alleviation. Uh, and China's also used soft power globally to push back on accusations, especially in de developing countries where it is investing substantial money. And it uses whataboutism to note that the US did horrible things during the war on terror and wiped out Native Americans um, with the implication of uh, kind of saying, why can't we do the same thing? Um, I think that going forward, it, it's, you know, I think it's very difficult to, um, to change the behavior of another state. Um, I think that uh, that being said, uh, if the US wants to influence the situation, I think one of the things it has to do is decouple the issue from geopolitical competition with China. Um, at the same time, you know, there's a need to press allies on the importance of this issue to the maintenance of international norms in an interconnected world and a world where China is gonna be playing a prominent role. Um, and I think um, it's particularly important, important <coughs> rather than focusing on these Magnitsky sanctions that basically um, bar officials from coming to the US, uh, keeping money in the US, I think that um, the focus should be on uh, products that are produced with Uyghur forced labor in their supply chain. And I have on my slide Chinese products, but actually that also includes a lot of products made by US companies. Um, uh, sh the, region, the Uyghur region makes, um, a, uh, I think it's maybe 70% of the cotton in the world that's that's then processed. Um, and uh, that is suggestive that um, most of the clothing that we're wearing, if we're wearing cotton clothing, um, probably goes through um, Uyghur forced labor at some point. Um, so I think it's real economic sanctions um, that put pressure on the private sector in China not Magnitsky sanctions that could demonstrate to the PRC that its actions are not in its own interest. Um, and that perhaps could lead to a change in behavior. So um, that's my presentation and um, I'll open it up for Q and A. Okay, um, got a bunch of questions to start. And first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you, as always. Um, the, first, the first question is, wh why is the Xinjiang region so important to the Chinese development plans and, and the Belt and Road Initiative? So um, I almost feel like bringing up that map again. The, you know, so uh, one of the things, one of the reasons I talk about um, uh, the historical background of China's relationship with this region is, um, I think when China begins um, economic reforms in first the 1980s, but really into the 1990s, it starts recognizing um, that rather than keeping out 
external influences and, and building buffer zones around it. It needs to um, be able to access markets abroad. And this region, because of where it's positioned, um, is uh, essential for reaching markets to the west and southwest over land. Um, you know, so as early as the late 1990s, before even the Belt and Road Initiative was uh, branded as such, it had kind of started in this region. Um, there were pipelines bringing hydrocarbons uh, from Central Asia. There's a, both a gas pipeline and an oil pipeline that brings uh, gas and oil to China and it has to go through this region. Um, there's uh, been plans to increase the um, transportation across those borders. Um, and in particular, um, the, ch the part of the Belt and Road Initiative involving Pakistan, which is called CPAC, um, basically, or CPEC, it's, um, it, it seeks to build uh, a transportation line, roads and rail that would go over the mountains from the Uyghur region into Pakistan down to the port of Gwadar, which is, um, which is essentially owned by uh, China. Uh, they have rights to use it um, uh, now. And, and that would give China access, easy um, sea access to the Persian Gulf. Um, so, you know, I think that it's, um, it's a critical part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And that may be part of the reason you see this urgency um, to take care of this situation very quickly. Um, because the Belt and Road Initiative, of course, is the signature foreign policy initiative of Xi Jinping. Um, and, uh, you know, within the Chinese Communist Party, everybody's um, now trying to pander to Xi Jinping and fulfill his visions. Okay. Um, is it possible also that there's, that there's oil in the, Western, in the Western region there and that they're also after that? There is, there is, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of natural resources there. Uh, in fact, uh, the Soviets um, were exploiting them uh, in the early 20th century. Um, uh, and, you know, there's oil and there's a lot of, in fact, most of the development initially in the region in the 1990s and early 2000s was focused on the building of um, uh, oil refineries. Um, and there's also um, mining. Um, I'm not sure if there's rare earth uh, metals there, but um, they have also used it as um, a significant site for the production of wind energy. Um, and they're increasingly trying to make it uh, um, an industrial hub. So there's factories building um, uh, solar panels in the region. Um, there's of course a lot of um, textile production. Um, it's also, as I mentioned, um, agriculturally rich. Um, and one, one of the things that's interesting um, about the Chinese think tank pieces where they're talking about reducing the population density, they're also aware that they need to take Uyghurs out. It's not enough um, to just put more Han into the region because uh, it's a somewhat ecologically fragile region. It's in the, it's, the center is a desert and it's surrounded by mountains which allow for glacier um, fed water to the region, but um, you know, it, it cannot handle um, a certain level of population. Um, you know, so, so that requires that not only um, do more Han need to move there, but if, if they want to change the balance, they need to also remove Uyghurs or prevent them from reproducing. <laughs> right. So the next one is, um, and I'm assuming, I, I think I know the answer to this, but are there other minority groups in China that are obviously worried about the Uyghur treatment and that it may come home to them? Um, there probably are. Um, 
you know, it's this this is almost um, a taboo issue to talk about in China right now. Um, there's not a lot of um, publicly available information. The Chinese government is kind of uh, feeding the state media with positive uh, pictures of what's happening in this region. In fact, it's interesting, um, uh, the Chinese um, diplomacy has been increasingly aggressive over uh, the last year in particular. And um, there was, um, you know, in, in response to some sanctions and this, this genocide designation, the Chinese government came out with this big campaign in China to say, you know, this is, this is all lies, um, you know, things are great in Xinjiang. And this was available to Chinese citizens. And all of a sudden, a lot of people uh, in China were saying, what's happening in Xinjiang? What's, what's going on that the state is saying, you know, uh, nothing bad is happening. Um, you know, I think there are, uh, it's, it's difficult for most Chinese to access information freely. Um, I think the Hui Muslim population, which is a large Muslim population uh, that's more um, culturally uh, Chinese, that speaks Chinese, um, I think they're very concerned about what's happening. Um, I think uh, probably Tibetans, to the degree that they know anything is happening, um, but certainly Tibetans outside of China are very alarmed about this. Okay. So we have U.S. we have U.S. law. Um, we have a lawyer in the group. So U.S. Code 19 U.S. Um, 19 U.S.C. 1307 actually prohibited the import, importation of products made by forced labor since at least 1930, if not earlier. And so the question is, is there additional legislation necessary for U.S. Customs um, to seize these products? And, and why aren't we seizing things now? Well, actually there has been, there have been some things seized. Um, uh, and I think, so I think the first thing is, um, of course, the, the problem with our forced labor laws is they're probably not always implemented because um, it requires a lot of research to actually show that things have been um, uh, created with forced labor. Um, and uh, so there have been several things seized. So one was a massive shipment of um, human hair um, that was believed to have come from uh, Uyghurs in internment um, that was going to be used for hair e extensions, it was being sold as hair extensions. Um, there's also been uh, some cotton products seized. Um, there's also uh, been, um, uh, I'm trying to think what was most recently, I can't remember, but there's been, there's been some things seized. So that, so they, you know, there, there's also, it's interesting, the first thing that the US government did was it passed a law called the Uyghur Human Rights Protection Act. And that, uh, my analysis, non-legal analysis of it, suggested that this law didn't really do anything new, except required the executive to um, report to Congress on what it was doing with regards to the Uyghur issue. So it was, it was kind of a, a law that was creating an incentive to make sure you were looking at this issue. Um, and uh, as a result, I think that the customs has uh, increased its seizure of, of things. Um, I think the new legislation is focused on, uh, in, because I don't know how uh, the legislation um, that the audience member is talking about, how it deals with things that are in the supply chain. So, you know, one of the problems is, so there, there's been some investigative reporting suggesting that um, some of the parts in Apple phones and computers are um, involve forced Uyghur labor, um, but that's a lot harder to prove 
Um, and one of the things that uh, I think the new legislation is being considered by Congress is looking at is um, putting the onerous on companies um, to show that its supply chain does not um, have forced labor in it. And um, for that reason, a lot of big companies, um, Apple, Nike have been kind of pushing back quietly on this and uh, through lobbying Congress. So I guess the question is, and, and this is always the question when you, when you implement sanctions or bans on goods, and that is if we, if we implement bans on Uyghur produced goods, um, forced labor goods, could that also have a spillover effect to Uyghur produced goods and in fact actually hurt the Uyghurs themselves? Probably not anymore um, because, uh, you know, one of the things early on uh, in this process, this campaign in 2017, I mentioned that uh, arrest rates skyrocketed and most of the arrests were prominent Uyghurs. Uh, it was kind of a decapitation um, of the nation. Um, you know, it, it took out intellectuals, businessmen, even uh, party officials, uh, all accusing them of um, facilitating terrorist activity and supporting terrorist activity. Um, so I don't think right now, you know, there may be some uh, wealthy Uyghurs, particularly uh, outside of the Uyghur region right now, who may be uh, still having substantial businesses. Um, but I think right now, um, the Uyghurs are generally uh, cut out of that. Um, and I don't think uh, there's many, if, if there are people, um, they may themselves be complicit in the crackdown because <laughs> I think there's no other way to, to be doing business as usual if you're not. So we talked about getting our, you know, potentially our allies and partners, perhaps the EU and others on board with some of your suggestions, um, principally to ban products that are created by forced labor. Um, and as you talked about with Apple, there's, you know, some pushback um, from, you know, the business consideration aspect of that. And I think we're seeing that um, with the European Union nations and China in general. Um, so with that kind of as a background, how do, you, how do you get the allies and partners to sign on to this and to basically give up some of their economic um, considerations or their economic advantages by doing business with China and by doing business with forced labor coming out of the Xinjiang province? Yeah, I mean, I you know, to be perfectly honest, um, in... In the conclusion to my book, I, I advocate for a more grassroots approach because I think that um, state-centered uh, approaches, although I welcome them, um, I think that one, what we're seeing is a, a lot of initiatives coming out of the US. I mentioned that the Chinese state is kind of pushing back saying, this is this entire um, idea that there's this genocide happening uh, is a fabrication of the U.S. And I think that's appealing um, for a lot of states to hear um, if they don't want to cut off economic relations. And this is particularly true with, uh, I think, the Muslim world, um, you know, the Muslim majority states. I think a lot of the citizens in Muslim majority states are very concerned about this issue, but most of the states themselves are not. And they're trying to, um, they're trying to ignore that it's happening so they can continue work with China um, as usual. Um, and, um, you know, so that's one thing. I think uh, the US, history in um, kind of birthing the, the war on terror um, has delegit, 
delegitimized us um, in the face of the international community on an issue like this that uh, is justified by counterterrorism. Um, so in some ways I see perhaps the best way uh, is to, to, um, to really get grassroots support for, for boycotting products, because I think that is one way that um, we're seeing in today's world with social media, uh, companies are often quick to respond to, um, <coughs> to grassroots movements on the internet about yeah. that are basically trying to discredit them. There was, there was, there's been several of these um, that have happened over the last couple of years. <coughs> there was one, it was identified in a picture in an internment camp that people were making sweatshirts for a certain company. And very quickly it was discovered that most of the universities in the United States bought their sweatshirts from this Chinese company. And immediately the universities said, oh, we're getting a new supplier. Um, so I think that that kind of pressure is the pressure that might actually um, have some results. Um, you know, I think if, if states can also back that, but there's lots of reasons that states are unwilling, I think, to uh, put pressure on China. Right. So how do the, how do the Han Chinese actually view the Uyghurs? Do they, do they see them as equals with simply different political views? Do they see them as an inferior race of human beings? Do they see them as non-human beings? And then if the latter or, or something heading towards the latter, then obviously we've got men marrying women um, for various reasons. So how do they, how do they square that one? So, um, you know, I think that there's always been um, a, um, a Dean, I have a meeting, <laughs> my daughter, sorry about that. Um, uh, I think there's always been kind of a colonial attitude towards the Uyghurs where they've looked at them as uh, underdeveloped uh, and, you know, um, lazy, a lot of the stereotypes you might find um, about um, minorities that are uh, repressed around the world, right? Um, maybe a little bit dangerous, but more having to do with crime. Um, but ultimately, you know, not um, un, um, unrehabilitatable. Unreha um, and I think that the terrorism narrative has really changed that. I think that um, one of the things I talk about in my book is I feel that the war on terror has kind of unleashed uh, a certain kind of um, way to categorize entire populations. Uh, because as our counterterrorism um, efforts have focused increasingly on the ideology, which ends up being the religion. Uh, it's translated in a lot of places, um, you know, I think even among certain populations in the US as Islam is the reason for terrorism. Um, and, and that, you know, very quickly leads to a dehumanization of these people. Um, all of the literature on mass atrocities and uh, genocide talks about the fact that you have to dehumanize people before you can actually do um, unspeakable things to them. And I think the terrorism narrative has allowed um, the Chinese state to essentially dehumanize these people to a differing degree than uh, just um, even five years ago. So as we as we talk about you know potential ways to stop the cultural genocide, the the question is is how much of the damage is essentially irreparable at this point, um, or are we past the tipping point, or 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 is there or is there hope? I mean, so um, I think we're not past the tipping point, but um, there's been extensive damage done already. And uh, so much so that um, I think that it, the only way um, to kind of walk this back, I, I kind of feel that the Chinese government has, has, has um, backed itself into a corner uh, 
because what um, if they just let everybody out of prisons, uh, they told people you don't have to be in forced labor anymore. There would be a lot of angry Uyghurs, which would essentially, you know, create more of this security issue, right? And more of this um, uh, basically uh, branding Uyghurs as a security threat. I think somebody has to be blamed for this. And um, there has to be a major mea culpa to the Uyghur people from the state. And the difficulty is, you know, in, in a lot of authoritarian countries, um, the state is able to back out of these type of atrocities by blaming it on local government. But it's too late for that because Xi Jinping and um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs have all basically uh, gone full in on the policies that are, are taking place. So the only way I see um, really there being a change is if there is um, you know, a, a realization among certain elites in the party that this is counterproductive for China and Xi Jinping has to be removed. Um, you know, and that's the type of thing that, um, you know, I don't think any international player can facilitate. I think it's just something that, um, you know, could happen. Um, and I think there's, there's evidence that Xi Jinping has, he, he's really established himself as more of a power source than anybody um, since Mao Zedong in China. And uh, I'm sure that there's a lot of people in the elite who are already concerned about that. Um, and the question is if, if economic pressure could convince those people that um, the situation has gone to a tipping point that uh, it can't tolerate it anymore. Got one more question for you. We're kind of past our witching hour here, but one last question. And that is obviously China's very diverse um, in terms of its language. They do have stand, you know, Mao standardized reading and writing, but the actual languages are still complicated and diverse. Um, do the Uyghurs speak one dialect? So, um, so the, the Uyghur language itself is um, completely different from Chinese. It's uh, a Turkic language. Um, there certainly are different dialects of Uyghur, um, but not that much different than the different dialects of English you hear in the U.S., um, which can be quite diverse. <laughs> um, yeah, so they're regionally based. Um, but what's interesting is um, when I uh, did a lot of a lot of traveling in the region in the late 1990s, the beginning of 2000. Um, there were very few Uyghurs who spoke Chinese. Um, now, uh, I was just talking to a journalist who was just there and she said it was incredible um, that all of these Uyghurs were speaking Chinese because they had been forced to go through these classes. And they're of course being taught the standardized um, Mandarin dialect, right? That that is um, that the state is trying to promote as the lingua franca. Um, but yeah, so um, but themselves, Uyghurs, you know, don't speak Chinese unless they're taught it. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was absolutely terrific. I learned a lot tonight. Um, for those folks who are interested in more on this, I don't know whether you know this or not, but there's a PBS special on this tonight. As a matter of fact, at 10 o'clock tonight, there's a show on PBS called Frontline, and they're going to be talking about this exact subject. Um, so if people are interested in more of this. Um, with that also, we have one more webinar to go this summer. Um, our next speaker is going to be Steve Carmel. He is a senior vice president at Maersk Shipping, and he's going to talk to us about global supply chains. So we all hear about how various supply chains are broken. We also hear about the fact that some politicians want to bring all sorts of manufacturing back to the United States. And what he's going to tell you is it's not that easy. Okay, there's a lot, there's a lot involved in that. So um, save the date, please. So that's June 24th, and um, it'll be 6 p.m. And 
that'll be that. And again, Dr. Roberts, thank you, thank you, thank you. And to our folks out there, thank you all very much for tuning in tonight. And of course, um, be safe and healthy and have a good night. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.